Okay. Uh, thanks for introducting me. This, this, that idea, this, this, this topic must, must be a bit easier than the first one a couple of years ago. Anyway, so the title is uh, Nanoplatelets, the lateral confinement models, uh, observing accident moving as a quantum uh, particle in a box. So, the sign of uh, my talk, hope you can still hear me. Um, so I will first introduce the concept of valence conduction band and energy gap in semiconductors. After that, I will differentiate between free charge carriers and exciton and how they can be used in optoelectronic devices. Uh, then I will talk about quantum confinement, uh, introduce cadmium 79 nanoplatelets and then uh, showing results and then slowly <laughs> somehow, let's say, driving you towards my model and uh, analysis. So let's start with semiconductor. So let's take, let's say, the most common element, semiconductor element, silicon, and let's consider this, let's say, this orbital scheme of the silicon atom, and you have this SMP um, orbital. And what's happened is that as soon as you, let's say, bring together different atoms to form a crystal, as often is the case in semiconductor, uh, then you start to share, like the electron are starting to get shared uh, along these different atoms. So you have this sharing of orbitals. And what's happened is, let's say that this P and S orbital, they kind of bound and anti-bound um, together and they form at the end on the right side of this uh, scheme two different bands, which are called valence band and conduction band. The former is completely full of electrons and the second one is actually completely empty and they are separated by this energy gap in here. Uh, for people working with molecules, uh, you can uh, basically link these two terms with the LUMO and HOMO, where LUMO is the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital and the HOMO is the highest occupied molecular orbital. So with this in mind, let's give a kind of introduction to what are free carriers and excitons. So again, on the left side, I'm reporting like a simple scheme of valence and conduction band. Uh, the blue dots uh, uh, stands for electrons. Um, and on the right side, let's say there is a scheme of a crystal. So a periodic arrangement of uh, atoms. So let's consider now I'm shining light on my semiconductor and let's assume that this light has a energy with higher, which is higher than the band, the band gap energy. This would cause the electron to be promoted or excited uh, towards the conduction band. And this electron will leave behind a hole, which is nothing else than an ionized atom. And uh, because both the electron and hole have empty states, um, let's say close by themselves, then they can actually move. So what's happened is that these charges can actually diffuse within the crystal and eventually can actually find each other because they have opposite charge, then they kind of bound together because of the column interaction. And all of this is gonna minimize the energy of your system. And what's happened is that you create an exciton. So they are bound electronal pairs and the energy of, of this exciton actually lies in between the band gap. What is interesting about the exciton is that he has a, is real, um, but you also have um, a certain ball radius, so like uh, let's say the, the distance between the two charges. And uh, as the free charges, this um, species can uh, diffuse, but eventually can actually recombine and emit light. So how these, uh, let's say, species are used in optoelectronic devices, I'm gonna show you now. And first I would like to give a really uh, general definition of op optoelectronic device, which is something which converts light in electricity or vice versa, electricity in light. So let's take the easiest example of a solar cell, which is here schematized by a crystal uh, with two electrodes on the left and right side. So let's imagine to shine light again, create this plus and minus charge, so electron and holes, and uh, they will diffuse oppositely in an opposite way because of the different sign. And they will actually, let's say, rise a current, form a current, which will light your bulb. So that's, let's say, the general idea about a solar cell. Vice versa, in what well, I will use exitons, for instance, for LED, is that you are actually injecting electron and hole from the electrode to the crystal. Again, these electron and hole can find each other, forming an exciton, and at the end, the exciton is going to recombine and emitting light. So, uh, after this introduction, I will, uh, let's say, briefly discuss quantum confinement. Uh, in here, I'm, uh, because I'm in love with germanium, that was my PhD uh, background. Uh, I'm showing you here a nice piece of germanium, <laughs> bulk germanium, and uh, let's say the left um, part of the slide is a scheme of the balance band and conduction band separated by the energy gap. 
what is happening is that as soon as I make germanium or any material quite small, and I surround them with a material which has a higher energy gap, then I have uh, the formation, or like I have, a, like let's say that the energy gap is actually increasing, and it's actually increasing inversely proportional to the square of the size. So let's say these two lines, this difference in here was the band gap energy in the bulk, and now it's gonna get uh, bigger because of the confinement. Here is a nice TM picture of uh, multiple uh, germanium quantum wire, where the quantum wire are the, the dark one, separated by this uh, CG uh, interlayer. So that's that's why confinement. But another nice thing to show you is uh, the case of the quantum dots. So in a quantum dots, you have actually confinement along the three dimension. So it's a quite strong confinement. And uh, it's nice to see from this picture that from going, for instance, from a nano, nano, quantum dots of six nanometers towards a, a one of two nanometers, then you have, according to this scheme, an increase of the energy gap. And you can actually see that because if you excite this material and you create exciton, then this exciton will recombine and will emit light depending on the band gap. It's also quite uh, already used by companies for uh, making LEDs or screens and so on. So we go now to the main topic of the talk, which are those um, cadmium 79 nanoplatelets. I'm giving you um, uh, an example of a TM image of one of the samples I will show you later. So you can see there are really uh, kind of, uh, yeah, uh, I don't know, flakes. They call it nanoplaters because of the size. So what you usually do after you prepare a sample is that you take these TM images, which is way larger than what I'm showing you here. And uh, you basically count all the nanoplatelets and measure all the size of the nanoplatelets. And then you consider this distribution I'm reporting on the bottom. You can therefore consider that they distribute, distribute in a Gaussian way. So you can uh, perform a Gaussian fit and let's say get what is the average size for the lateral dimension, so Lx and Ly. What I didn't tell you so far is that as far as I remember, because I don't know this, this, this material, I mean, I don't synthesize this material myself, but they come from Utrecht. Um, the, 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 the point is that you can change the lateral size by changing the amount of water during the, the, the procedure, during the, the, the recipe, yeah, let's call it. But what doesn't change is the thickness. So the thickness always remain, in this case, in my study, remains 1.4 nanometers, which is quite small. Uh, while instead, what I'm gonna change and I'll show you later is the lateral size. Um, so in order to explain better things later, I have to introduce, let's say, what is the typical uh, emission and absorption spectrum uh, in, uh, in uh, nanoplatelets. Yeah, there is an example. On the right side, there is again a band um, a structure scheme where now I'm highlighting two different bands for the valence band, which are the, called the heavy hole and light hole bands. Um, and uh, yeah, so to describe the, the, the absorption spectrum, the first peak is associated to excitonic transition. So, so from the heavy hole band towards its own uh, excitonic states. Then at higher states, you can consider all this transition to the continuum, which means from these states of the valence band towards any states in the, inside the conduction band. And the same is gonna happen for the, for the light hole. So for the exciton and for the continuum. Finally, the emission instead comes generally from the lowest energy states because things ten, tend to, to, to relax towards the lowest energy state. So ideally, uh, it is, um, let's say, always uh, uh, like people always uh, make the assumption that the emission comes from, from, from let's say, from the HH uh, state. So from this, from this level in here. So with this in mind, here are the samples I'm gonna um, study. I have been studying. So I have four different samples with different lateral sizes. We go from sample S5 to sample S1. Here, five and one stands for the. Uh, Um, which is basically the, um, which is basically the, um, yeah, the ratio between the two lateral sizes. And uh, yeah, we go basically from um, uh, rectangular to square nanoplatelets. And this is how the different spectra for absorption PL change with sizes. So I'm gonna list all the observation we can see from this panel in here. Um, the first one is that we have a red shift from going to S5 to S1 of the peak, all the peaks. So the HH and the LH also of the PL, but I'm not showing you in here. So you have really like a, a, a decrease of the energy as soon as you increase the size, the lateral size of the nanoplatelets. The second observation is that if you look at the width of this PL emission, then they actually shrinking by increasing the size of the nanoplatelets as is shown in this panel in here. 
The third observation um, concerned the, 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 the stock shift, which is defined as the difference between the peak of the absorption and the peak of the PL. Also, this is, um, is, it seems to change with the, with the nanoplatelet area in this panel. And finally, what I want to highlight is this, let's say, asymmetric character of the absorption peak, which increases by going from here to here. And uh, you can actually, like, let's say, see yourself the asymmetry by comparing this with the PR. The PR is quite symmetric. Instead, you have this kind of tail in the absorption, which, as I will show you in a bit, is explained by, by, by our model. So uh, I'm going to introduce really quickly the stock shift, what it is. Um, so I, uh, let's say, told you that we have exidonic states. What I didn't tell you is that these exidons can actually couple with phonons. A phonon is a vibration of, of the crystal. Um, therefore, like, let's say, in this simple scheme, you can kind of, uh, with this molecular picture, you can kind of understand that you, at the end, you will find an absorption spectrum which is asymmetric towards the high energy side, and the PL spectrum which is asymmetric in the opposite direction. And as soon as the stock shift is quite big, you can see this kind of effect. In our case, our PL is completely symmetric, which means that the asymmetry in the absorption doesn't come from the stock shift, also considering that the difference in here is quite small. So again, I'm trying to say that we will ascribe this asymmetry with our model, which is this part in a box model for excellence. So nanoplate, let's, let's, let's consider a bit the quantum confinement on these systems. First, I'm gonna talk about the quantum confinement along the thickness, so the Z direction. So another way to define the quantum confinement is that let's consider you have a bulk cadmium selenide material and it's well known that the ball radius in here is 5.4 nanometers. So the distance between hole and electron in an exciton is 5.4 nanometers. Here we can talk about strong confinement because our lateral strongly confined. Um, instead, so also, I, I, and now we start to, to get the, 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 the most difficult part. You can actually work out, you can, you can yeah, calculate what is the, 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 let's say the change in the binding energy. And this is actually given by this expression in here. And you can kind of see that it depends on the size, true, but it also depends on the effective mass of this electron and hole separately. Uh, the concept of effective mass, it's uh, something I can try to explain quickly. Um, so if you have a free electron in vacuum, it has the, the, the well-known electron mass. But as soon as you have an electron or a hole inside a crystal, then this electron is actually experiencing all the environment and is kind of getting a different mass because of that. So it responds differently to stimuli because it has a different mass. And another thing I want to highlight is that as soon as you create a two-dimensional system, then you are actually changing the ball radius of your exciton. And this has been reported in cadmium selenide nanoplatelets to be between 1.8 and 4.1 nanometers. So there is a certain uncertain, uncertain about that. Uh, but by keeping in mind this value in here, and by considering the size we have for, for our nanoplatelets, we are in a regime that our size is actually still bigger than this 4.1 nanometer ball radius. So the, the confinement is not gonna be strong. So what we have to consider, rather than the, let's say, the, the, the motion of electron and hole alone, we have to consider the center of mass motion. Yeah, depicted as this, this black dot in here. And therefore the confinement is actually defined by the center of mass motion confinement. And is described by this equation, where now the effective mass is this M, which is the total mass given by the sum of the electron and hole mass. And then basically this equation is telling you that you have different energy depending on the size of the nanoplatelets, but then you can have more quantum confined states, which goes with these quantum numbers and X and Y, which are integer, okay? So that's uh, starting to be a bit complicated, but just consider that in a nanoplatelet, you have exidonic state defined by the size of the nanoplatelets, and then you have different quantum states defined by these numbers in here. Even more complicated, in physics, we like to describe particles with, with, with wave functions. So we can define a simple wave function in the, system, in the system given by this expression in here. And then what we can calculate is this factor F, which is called oscillator strength, which actually define how strong your, your nanoplate will absorb a certain photons. So how strong will be a transition to form that excitons? And this, again, depends on the other side, but depends on the inverse square root of, of the quantum numbers, which means that higher 
tight than the first states one one. Another thing I have to say is that this equation in here is different than zero only if these quantum number, numbers are odd numbers. Instead, it's equal to zero if you have even one of them to be uh, an even number. So with this in mind, I would show you, let's say a first check of the model. So let's consider again this expression for different uh, exciton, HH and LH. Here is the, the J uh, term there. Now what I'm gonna do is that I'm considering only the first states, so one, one. I'm taking the L Y in here as the average while I'm tuning, let's say the LX between 10 and 35. And then I'm assuming this mass, which are reported in literature. And you can see that there is a well agreement, a really good agreement between the calculation, which is this, this shaded area uh, defined by this, let's say this, this range of LX. And you can see that really like this depicts goes, like really goes down. So the change energy according to the model we are using. So that's, let's say is a first check to actually prove that we are going in the right direction. So the next step would be trying to basically model a PL and absorption based on this uh, equation. And how we do that, it's a bit more complicated, but I will try to explain it anyway. <laughs> that's my task. Uh, so I have these four different um, samples for different sizes. I'm again, uh, let's say, uh, counting all the nanobladelets and uh, having a certain distribution on their size. So what, what we are gonna assume now is that in the steady state absorption PL I'm showing you, I, I have to consider that each nanobladelet will contribute to it. So what I can do is that I can take all the possible, let's say, combination of the X and the Y and know the possible, let's say, uh, excitonic states and X and then Y, and adding, adding, adding their energy on top of each other. So I can calculate for each size and each N the energy, which, which this nanoplate is gonna have, but then I have to wait how they absorb or emit according to the Oshiretto strength, but then I have also to wait that with the Gaussian distribution. The, what that means is that the most emission or absorption will, will come from the peak of this Gaussian distribution and less absorption or emission will come from the side. So with this in mind, uh, we can actually build uh, the model and uh, things we're gonna get more complicated now. But the idea is this one. So the intensity of the PR is given by the contribution of all, all the states inside the nanobladelets, but then I have to sum all the contribution from the different nanobladelets in here, which is basically an integral. Let's say this function in here is, wait a bit, in this panel and I am basically, I can calculate uh, the contribution of all the nanoplatelets in a single sample and all the states of these nanoplatelets and I have basically this one, one, three, one and five, one state. Their intensity changes because the oscillator strength changes. And the broadening of this is due to the fact that each nanoplatelet with a slightly different size will emit at a different energy. And in this, in this case, I'm considering that each nanoplatelet has a really well-defined energy. So what I can do now is actually considering the PL, and this is uh, another, let's say, bit more difficult point. In PL, what you have to consider is the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. So in a simple way is the fact that if you're exciting your samples or you're creating exitons, then these exitons are gonna, um, let's say, occupy different states, but the lower states and lower energy are gonna get more occupied than the higher one, simply because of thermal distribution. Uh, so ideally, if you increase the, the, the temperature, then you increase the population of the five one state. But what I'm doing in here is basically considering this maximum Boltzmann distribution, summing all these states and getting this dashed line in here, which I would say is the PL emission from a nanoplatelet for, for, for the sum of all the nanoplatelets without considering something that I will show you later, which is basically phonons. And I will show you later that. So I can basically calculate what is the line width of this emission like that for all the sample. So it's going from 16 to four. And I can show you that this trend is actually really reflecting the trend I have experimentally. So the change in the, in the line width of the PL is really explained by the size distribution plus the center of mass motion plus uh, the, 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 the Gaussian distribution of the state. So that's another check. That's another, like something which is telling us that we are going in the right direction. 
But now I want to make things more complicated. As I was saying, a certain nanoblade that doesn't emit only at a specified energy, but this energy is actually broad. And this broadening is due to two different uh, main contributions. The first one is the interaction with phonons. A phonon is simply a vibration of the crystal. So as soon as you have, for instance, you are doing experiment at room temperature, as in this case, the crystal is actually vibrating. So the, let's say that you can imagine that the size of the nanoplatelet is actually changing because of this vibration. So it doesn't emit only at a certain energy, but it has a certain indetermination on this energy. And the second term is this, uh, this blue uh, sigma HH, which instead considers what is called in homogeneous broadening, which means that Let's say there is a certain this amount of disorder also in a single nanoplate that cannot be not completely sharp, let's say 90 degrees corner or can have defects and so on. I'm considering these two effects with this um, called void profile, uh, where the phonons are within a Lorentzian and um, the disorder uh, in homogeneous broadening is, is taken into account by a Gaussian. So a void profile is basically a, let's say, convolution of these two terms. So if I now use this model, take every sample, um, let's say consider like this, this, this distribution of sizes, the Yoshireto strength, the Maxwell distribution and so on, I'm actually able to reproduce data as I'm showing you in here. There is a really nice agreement. Uh, what I want to highlight, first of all, okay, the black line is the total fit. Then you have all the different contribution from the different states. And what is nice to see and what is, is, is fair to, to, to tell at this stage is that the model calculates these energies precisely. The only things, uh, let's say, it, 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 we, are, we are kind of using as a fitting parameter is this void profile, which is meant to be, and is actually not size dependent. So our model catch the size dependency, but it has to, let's say, take into account this dexion phonon contribution and the, and the inhomogeneous broadening. So now that I know, let's say, I, from Pierre um, fit, I know this term, I can also calculate the absorption, which is given by the sum of the different contribution as I was telling you at the beginning. But now these terms in here is basically the same as before of the PL without the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution, because I can ideally go for any initial states to any excitonic states because I'm not, let's say, constrained by the fact that they have to be populated or not. They, actually, they have actually to be empty, empty. So with this in mind, I can show you that the absorption is, is working quite well, it's fitting really good. So I have the different contribution in here and I can actually show you in details how the different states are contributing to that. And uh, this is working for those samples. And uh, most importantly, for instance, in this case where I have uh, the highest asymmetry, you can see that this asymmetry is given by these two states in here, which are kind of pushing up the absorption then. So this brings me to the conclusion um, so let's say we prove that exciton moves in a nanoplatelet according to this uh, particle in a box model I tried to explain you. Um, we do explain the energy shift with the lateral dimension of the nanoplatelets. Uh, we also explain how, let's say, the line width of the emission of these nanoplatelets is linked to the dimension, the lateral dimension of the nanoplatelets. And finally, I would like to highlight that our model is completely lateral size independent and all the lateral size dependency is basically inside the model. It's not a fitting parameter. It's something that we calculate a priori. So we from Utrecht. Uh, actually, I have to highlight that the sample I made from Bass, uh, Francisco made uh, the computational calculation um, and uh, yeah, and uh, Daniel and Hank helped us a lot with, uh, with nice discussions on. Finally, I would like to acknowledge NWO for financial support and uh, thank you for, uh, for your attention.